never seen to end I've seen hunger, strife, and struggle Folks pass by without a hand to lend People call me crazy, some people call me stone Others say I'm strung out, destined just to be alone Time and time again I've tried to put it on the shelf It's a dog, it's easy, babe Well, don't try it for yourself, I've got a soft spot For the hard stuff Or I can't see put it down And I put my whole life into a glass pipe And I burn it up so I Put it down And I'm 
Hey, how's it going, everybody? Happy Monday. Welcome back. It's another episode of Office Hours. Hope you guys all had a great week and a great weekend. Hopefully you guys were out there making some music, uh, checking out some of the stuff inside of Luna. Uh, and if you were in Luna, hopefully you guys all went and downloaded the Everyman Luna session from Fab and Louis Cato uh, that we launched last week. Uh, if you haven't done that already, uh, go back, you know, check out that episode, uh, number one, because it was a great, it was a nice hanging out with Fab and the gang again. Uh, but number two, make sure you go into the app, hit the diamond button, go to the, to the Discover tab, and there you'll be able to find the link to download uh, Lewis's session. Uh, there's going to be an update coming into that session this week. Uh, I know some, a few people, you may have noticed there was a, not a quad version of the song in there. It was just the full Fab mix, which took more than 40 SPs to power. The quad version is going to be in there uh, either later today or tomorrow. Uh, so if you're waiting on that, just check it out. Uh, keep on checking that page out. Um, and again, guys, I, I saw a few people in the chat noticing, uh, giving, giving a, some props to the intro music. Uh, if you guys have got music that you want to see featured on future UA Live episodes, uh, email them to us, live at uaudio.com. Uh, we love featuring music from our community. Uh, and it's always really cool. There's such a wild variety of stuff. Like last week, there's some cool Beatles stuff. This week, it was some cool country tunes. Uh, I am always always enjoy listening to these intros and hearing what you guys are doing. Uh, so make sure you guys are sending us music there and tagging your photos. Hashtag Universal Audio. And with that, let's jump in with Matt and Drew. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. Hey, doing man, good. Morning, Ben. Morning, Matt. Uh, wait, Matt, where are you? Matt, you're you're not <laughs> sitting at the desk. What What's going on? I know. Where's your dog? Drum kit. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Had to kick him out. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's a little bit different uh, setting than you normally see me in, but I'm just on the other side of the room. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Well, we've, uh, you know, people who, you know, longtime viewers have noticed in the back of Matt's room, there's been a MIDI drum kit back there. And we've seen plenty of requests, people asking, how can I use a MIDI drum kit with uh, virtual instruments such as Shape inside of Luna? So the answer to that question is coming at you guys today, as well as uh, we've got some really cool tips about uh, the Fairchild 660 and 670 plugins, uh, which I know a lot of you a lot of you already have, but some of you uh, might be sleeping on the powerful Fairchild. Uh, so Drew's going to walk us through a few examples on that. Uh, we're gonna by the end of this episode, you're all going to want a Fairchild 670 to have <laughs> to have and to own and to put on every one of your mixes because it can do some the really real cool one. Yeah, you want a real one, but in case you can't quite swing that, we'll, we'll be able to get you the plug-in. If you don't have the thirty thousand sitting in your bank account for a real Fairchild right now, uh, we've All got right. the UAD one available. <laughs> uh, so, so good uh, seeing lots of love here in the chat. Everybody, everybody's loving it. Uh, I did see some good stuff happening in the pre-show though. People are asking about uh, a UA oriented community to to join up, uh, and the good news for you guys is there is there's an entire dedicated forum to UAD. Uh, UADForum.com. Is that correct, Drew? Yep, yep. Yeah, actually, Forum or Forums, they both point to the same place. So, yeah, UADForum or Forums.com. We'll nice. get you there. And that's, uh, I know you hang out there a lot, uh, but overall, it's it's basically a lot of UA. It's a lot of UA nerds, a lot of UA talk. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. overall, it seems like, a, a, overall, it's similar to Office Hours, right? It's a very, uh, it's a fairly oh, yeah. positive, everyone, everyone there is yep. good people. Yeah, it's awesome. It, it, that, that's, a, that's a great way to describe it, Ben. It basically like an online version of Office Hours. Like we have we have some amazing mods, you know, uh, Matt Hepworth, who's been re- doing it for many, many years. Um, you know, super knowledgeable guy, super helpful guy. And Dan and Don and Richard, we have lots of really great moderators who are on there. So if you have any questions that, you know, don't get covered here or you don't get, you know, that you put into the chat here, maybe we don't get to it, then by all means, come over to uadforum.com. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a treasure trove of information existing, but it's also a borderline real time way of interacting with other, um, you know, super knowledgeable users and super helpful users. So, yeah, if you haven't been there, definitely check it out. Nice. Uh, yeah, people, a lot, lot of love here for the Fairchild. People, and Drew, just earmark this for when we get there. People want clarity about the side chain, the time constants, some of the advanced yeah. things. And we're, yeah, we're going to walk you guys through all that. Basically, there'll be a good uh, good how to, a good like how to get started in there, as well as getting you guys familiar with the all the things it can do. Because it that is such a tone beast. Uh, but there's a few things that are a little bit quirky. You know, it's the old way, it, it was built in the old fashion, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll discuss all that stuff later. Um, yes, we will. And do you, uh, Marcel's asking, do UA plugins get updates from time to time, or is the first release version the final one? 
they do get updates. In fact, uh, in the last last couple of software releases, you guys may have noticed a lot of them have been getting getting GUI enhancements. Uh, so they've been upgrading the older plugins for Retina graphics. Uh, but sometimes when they go in there, uh, for example, the 1176 collection, they went in and actually not only updated the graphics to be Retina compatible, but they actually added some extra features that we've been integrating into more and more of our plugins, like the headroom control, the mix knob, uh, and those even now have a sidechain filter that you can activate in them as well. Um, so it doesn't happen often, but UAD plugins do get updated. And of course, if any bugs are ever discovered, those get fixed. And you know, you guys uh, on the downloads page, you can always check out the release notes, which will not only detail what's new, but also some of the some of the stuff that got fixed. Because uh, there's always like these weird, quirky, you know, a certain plugin will like make Cubase crash or something like that, where uh, you know, it affects a few people. Uh, but we we end up fixing those as we discover them as much as possible. As far as the modeling goes, you know, I, I think Will would like to think that they get it right the first time. You know what I mean? So, you know, you nail it that first mm -hmm. time. And, it, you know, sonically, they shouldn't need any updating. But Tricky had a, a good follow-up question here. Uh, do the update upgrades get auto-updated? No. So UAD, uh, UAD is a little bit different than Luna. You guys are probably, if, if you're like me, you're getting really spoiled by Luna just automatically telling me whenever there's an update and helping me do that. With UAD plugin updates, you got to go download the UAD package to get those updates. Uh, so we always suggest, you know, this is why we put out a big email anytime there's a big UAD release, uh, which contains not only new plugins, but also all these updates and fixes. Uh, so we always email everybody, make sure you guys all know about those updates happening on the UAD platform. Uh, but just every time you see those emails, uh, you know, we always recommend download the latest version of the UAD driver. It keeps your software up to date, bug fixes, new plugins, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I think with with that, uh, you guys keep on dropping keep on dropping amazing questions here in the chat. We'll keep on hitting them, but I do wanna do wanna get cracking on the show because this is gonna be a really cool one. So a, a lot of you guys have been asking like, how do I integrate a MIDI drum kit with virtual instruments inside of Luna? Uh, and there's some stuff that's like you know fairly obvious, but then there's gonna be some unobvious stuff. So we're gonna we're entrusting Matt here to kind of walk us through what this process looks like and how to uh, how to set up a drum set to link up a shape. Yeah. So Matt, totally. where, do we, where do we start on this one? Let me switch over to Luna here. Um, so yeah, I mean, Luna has great drum kits in shape um, and combined with like the low latency of ARM, it's really like a, a great way to play, maybe extend the sounds you already have in your brain, but play with some new sounds as well. Mm -hmm. um, so just to kind of set this up here, um, I just have a drum track uh, with shape loaded on it and a kit loaded up. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing to know here is if you don't have the track in ARM mode, you'll still be able to hear sounds like the uh, MIDI drum kit will still trigger shape, but make sure you do put it in ARM because that's going to actually give you lower latency. There was a, there's pretty noticeable latency if you don't have it in ARM. So, um, and, and that's sure because, that. cause Luna has like an auto MIDI monitor thing going on, right? So like whatever track you have selected, it'll, it'll activate it so you can listen through it, but it doesn't put, throw it into ARM mode immediately, which again, reduces the latency, right? Yeah, and that would be worse exactly. if you had, the more you have on your master fader, that, that latency could be even worse because it's actually flowing through the native mixer. Whereas when you it record enable it, it gets it disconnected from that main out and instead uses uh, some ARM paths to go straight to the monitors and cues. Yeah, so as soon as I turn on ARM mode, now it's routing the output of shape in the virtual channels and consoles so I can hear it without latency. It's not passing through whatever delay compensations happen in the session. So nice. um, always make sure that yeah, ARM stays on. Awesome. Um, and the other just kind of basic housekeeping thing, um, the MIDI in field over here, you can select the input for that particular track. Um, say you were jamming along with somebody else that was playing a keyboard hooked up to the same system. This would be particularly important in that scenario. Um, so I have my TD-15, uh, which is the, the MIDI drum kit I'm using, the Roland TD-15. Um, so I'm just going to select that input. That way, if someone were to walk over to my desk and hit my push or hit my uh, keyboard, it wouldn't trigger this drum kit. Um that's a, and that, that's kind of that's a practice I put it, I do a lot as well, right? Of like if you know you want an instrument to only be controlled by a single keyboard or a drum set, specifying its MIDI input just uh, can solve headaches that may happen later, such as you know like another a sequencer or something like that triggering drums and you losing your mind not knowing where that sound is coming <laughs> from. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, especially if you have a lot of other gear hooked up and MIDI flying around back and forth. Yeah, that's like Ben Studio, practice. like Ben. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like Ben Studio. <laughs> Nice. All right. So you got your MIDI hooked up, uh, and this works with any drum brain. We just want to, you know, want to point that out. Uh, so you're you're showing this today with a Roland kit, but um, all these features, Yamaha, Nord, uh, 
Simmons, just any any drum brain that supports MIDI out, uh, as long as you're getting that MIDI data into your computer, you'll be able to do any of this stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And pretty much every drum brain out there um, will let you, you know, reassign which MIDI message each uh, pad and uh, symbol trigger is sending. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm showing you here today. It's, it's on my TD15, but it'll apply to any drum kit that you have. Nice. Um, so yeah, let me. Uh, so yeah, off the bat, uh, I just pulled up like a blank uh, drum kit on my brain. Mm -hmm. So it's one that doesn't have sounds associated with it, and I haven't changed the mapping on it. And out of the box, a lot of the stuff in shape already works. It's already mapped. Like the kick is mapped, um, snares mapped, side sticks mapped, hi hats mapped. Um, pretty much everything. So if you're, especially if you have like a more basic drum kit that doesn't have uh, dual zone symbol triggers and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, you may not have to do any mapping out of the box. You might just be able to pull it up and it'll work. It really depends on what your drum kit is and what kind of triggers you have. <laughs> the, uh, well, and that's because right, uh, shape kind of follows a standard general MIDI, you know, kick C1, snare D, like it kind of follows that same uh, layout. Um, but then, uh, but you know, like in a kit like this, right? Uh, for those of you who are you're looking at this kit, you're like OWD kit. What is what is OWD? What? Uh, well, this is <laughs> this is actually uh, this is a bit of a hidden gem inside of shape here. This is a this is a drum set recorded at Oceanway Studios. This is an acoustic drum. It's it's actually a freaking fantastic sounding drum set. Uh, built into shape um, that uh, I think a lot of people skip over because they just see OWD. They're like, OW what? <laughs> yeah. like, Should have yeah. named that a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, the, the OWD one kit um, is my favorite one in shape. I mean, it, everything's modeled great. You can hear when I hit the toms. You can hear the snares rattling exactly on the left side where they would be. It's all from a uh, player perspective. That's mm -hmm. yeah, great model kits. Nice. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, uh, pretty much most things are mapped out of the box for like single trigger drums. Um, on my kit in particular, uh, the rack tom, it's mapped to crash for some reason. That's just the way Roland maps it out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, and then like all the rims on my toms aren't actually mapped to anything. And even like the, the rim on the hi-hat and the rim on the crash aren't mapped. So <clears throat> that's where um, the, the settings on the brain come in. If you've used Shape before, you probably noticed there's no way to actually assign different sounds to different MIDI notes. You have to do it on the brain side, the one that's actually sending the MIDI to Shape. Um, so let me switch over my camera here. Okay. Matt, you're getting uh, you're getting flack from the audio nerds for your plosives. They're like, where where was that pop <laughs> filter, Matt? Come on, dude. <laughs> Yeah, no. He's on his he's on his filter. annex setup. He's on his uh, yeah, secondary exactly. setup. It's on the B. It's on the B setup. <laughs> Cut guys. him some slack. Cut <laughs> him some slack. <laughs> yeah, I looked for my pop filter, but couldn't find it. So I usually don't record vocals. <laughs> <laughs> he's a drummer, guys. Forgive him, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> Just a stupid drummer. What do I know? <laughs> cool. See, so, yeah, I should be looking at the drum brain now. Yep. Cool. So, um. Let's start with like the hi hat for example. The uh, the top of the hi hat is mapped to the hi hat in the shape kit, but the rim of the hi hat is not. So on my kit, um, I have the just a blank kit pulled up. I'm gonna go to menu, scroll through the menu here, and go to MIDI. Um, and then this page, I can whatever I hit, it's gonna highlight that number. Um, so for example, the top of the hi hat is mapped to MIDI note 42. The side is 22, um, and shape actually doesn't have a, a sound assigned to that. Um, so most of the drum kits in shape, they don't have a different sample for like the top of the hi-hat and the side of the hi-hat. So mm -hmm. in this example, I'm just going to map the same, uh, sound to the top and the, the rim. So I'll hit the rim to select it. I'm going to go ahead and assign it to 42. Now, no, no matter where I hit on the hi-hat, whether it's the rim or the top, I'm getting the same sound. So that's great. Nice. I got a um, question here from Matt ask, or, uh, sorry, from, uh, Gerald, um, Gerard. Uh, he's asking if things are velocity sensitive inside of shape. Yes, very much so. So, yeah, it's, um, the latency is great. The the velocity sensitive is great. It's, it really feels like pl I'm playing the sounds that are in the brain, mm -hmm. um, the, the feel and everything. The way the responsiveness feels exactly like the sounds that come in the brain, but it's triggering externally, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, just like I did with that one, I'm gonna go over to well, yeah, the tom here. Tom's mapped to a crash. So um, some of this stuff, it's like there's no list of what shape assigns to which many notes. So you pretty much just got to trial and error it. Um, so I'm just going to cycle through. Yeah, so 47, that sounds like a high tom. So I'll stick with that one for this rack tom here. 
Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the rim on the rack tom. Again, Shape doesn't have a different sample for the tom and like the rim of a tom, so I'm just going to assign the same note to either zone. <coughs> so they're both on 47. No matter where I hit, it's going to trigger that same sound. Nice. So I can do the same thing for the rack or the uh, first floor tom here. And so, and so, yeah, as you guys may notice, like on the brain, it's all numbers, right? So these are note numbers, not note names. Uh, so it kind of seems like Matt, the way that you're doing this is kind of the best way to do it, right? Just kind of do it by ear, like kind of rotate through them, keep on, you know, hitting and adjusting, hitting and adjusting until you get to the sound that that you want to have mapped on that one, as opposed to like trying to line up. All right, this key is that on my keyboard, like trying to trans transmute between keyboard key name key number drum brain it's just a lot easier to sit there hit it move it hit it move it until you find what you want to map for each sound yeah exactly i mean that that's definitely the way to do it um i, I don't pay too much attention to what the actual numbers are and everything i pretty much just hit it and, until i find something i like i'm gonna stick with that and on my drum brain you know, i don't know if you can see over here underneath the little picture of the drum it actually does show you the note like it says g2 right now mm -hmm. um, but again i don't pay much attention to that i'm just using my ears for this process nice yeah so now i have all my toms mapped um and you can pretty much repeat that process for all your symbols here i mean it, for example most of the drum kits and shape will have like a couple different crashes um if you wanted to, you know, assign a different crash sound, you can just cycle through them. Find something you like. Um, so, yeah, it's really just a trial and error, kind of doing it by ear process. Mm -hmm. Nice. Right. So so now now you've got all of, so now you've kind of gone pad by pad, programming in, making sure that they're linked up to the right thing. Uh, now, if you go from kit to kit, I assume, you know, essentially you're going, you're changing sounds now in shape if you go from one kit to another kit but then the mappings can stay the same because those are on your drum brain so you're able to kind of you know set this up once and then take that from kit to kit and of course you'd, if you wanted to change what pad was doing what uh you'd have to go back to the brain to adjust it but now it's kind of locked in there on your drum brain which which keys to output yeah and that's a great point i mean this is something you really only have to do once because pretty much all of the kits in shape they follow the same um, general midi mapping so once i figure out how to uh, map my particular drum kit to whatever shape is giving me i can apply that i can pretty much just save that as a patch on my drum brain and then i can pull up any uh, kit in shape and it'll uh, map the same sounds to the same zones so for example let me uh, change the drum kit here the best part about the ocean way kit is that there's two of them yeah, so that's uh, the first one I was playing was OWD Kit 1. It's a little bit tighter kit. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's OD OWD Kit 16. Don't ask me where 2 through 15 went. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, then this one's a little fatter, a little um, more oh, detailed. Nice, yeah. Uh, yeah, different sounding kind of kit. So, yeah, and import and importantly, all the, drums, is, all, all, all the drums are panned drummer's perspective so if you're if you're in the if you're sitting in the hot seat you got your hi-hat over here on the left just like you would in the real world yeah exactly hi-hats on the left hit the floor tom it's over here on the right snare is a little to the left everything's panned really well feels really natural mm -hmm. um, i've definitely played some like drum kits that are supposed to be supposed to feel natural and you hit something that's just like way hard panned or straight down the center you know when yeah. it's supposed to be on the side it yeah, definitely takes you out of the experience um so yeah shape is very meticulously like laid out in that way nice um, yeah I, I can pretty much go through any of these kits in shape now i'll even pull up you know one of the less uh authentic ones. yeah it's so pretty much any <laughs> kit that i bring up nice. in shape everything is you know mapped exactly how it expected to be um so again i only have to do this once on my drum brain and then i can save it i don't have to think about it again unless i want to play around with uh you know mapping different sounds to different symbols or whatever Nice. And yeah, can you that's, tune? That's the the do you have any control over the tuning, Matt? Like, can you tune kicks and snares inside the kits and stuff? Yeah, some of them. Uh, like, for example, this timeless kit. Um, like the Ocean Way drum kits, they're pretty much uh, just set. They don't let you tune the snares and kicks and everything separately. But some of the more gotcha. Um, yeah, more like production based kits that aren't supposed to feel like a real drum kit. Those usually do have tuning. 
Um, so for example, this timeless kit, I can kick all, or I can tune all the kicks uh, up and down, and there are multiple kicks in each kit. Um, so this, for example, if I turn this up a couple semitones, that's map, that's uh, tuning every single kick in this timeless kit up by one semitone, not just the first kick. Gotcha, um, same thing yeah. with snares, same thing with cymbals, and same thing with the, the percussion. That's cool. Nice. Yeah, it's super flexible, super easy to use, and yeah, it's once you get it dialed in the first time, then you really don't have to think about it again. You can just pull up sounds. The latency is great. Everything's laid out the way we expect it to be. Um, less thinking and more playing once you once you do that initial setup. Yeah, which is that's the ideal world right there. Is you know be able to set this up and uh, and get to making music. Yeah, exactly. Nice man. Um, let me see. Let me just scroll through here on the comment. Any any questions about MIDI drum kits? You guys felt like we didn't quite get to. Um, oh, Gabriel's asking: Is it possible to create individual tracks? For example, one for hi hats, one for the kick, etc. Uh, I guess you. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you probably could do this, but the you'd have to do some like tricky MIDI filtering or MIDI channel assignments sort of stuff, right? Where um, uh, it kind of depends on the drum brain, but I, I think some of them what you could do is you could say like kick is channel one, snare is channel two, hi hats are channel three, and then in Luna you would then be able to set multiple tracks, so you could have your kick one listening just to channel one uh, out of your brain, the snare is listening to channel two. Um, I don't know, does your brain function like that, Matt? So my brain in particular doesn't. It just lets you select the MIDI note. It doesn't actually let you select the MIDI channel. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had like something like the TD30, you know, the, the higher end drum kits, those do let you select channel per trigger. Mm -hmm. um, so for those, you could definitely do what you just said. You know, have a kick that's just triggering on channel one, have the snare that's triggering on channel two, um, and separate them out on the separate tracks in Luna. And then you could actually select, you know, uh, for your kick, track you could select one kit for your snare track you could select a different kit with a different snare you could really piece together um, different parts of different shape kits to put together like a super kit yeah uh and uh no no's asking here what if your drum module isn't current and can't change its mini notes can you change shape midi map so no no you hit you hit on the on the on the main thing we're kind of showing you guys you guys here today is that yeah the shape shapes midi map is fixed uh, so those sounds are, are linked specifically to a key, uh, and there's no remapping inside a shape. So that's why the remapping is happening on the drum brain here. Uh, so in your instance, uh, there might be some MIDI filtering uh, apps out there that would allow you to transform, uh, you know, be able to listen to the MIDI, transform it, and then and then output it. The only downside of that is like, especially if it's a software thing, my hunch is there's probably going to be a, a touch of added latency to do that, like listen to this note oh yeah it's supposed to be this note and then output it into uh into shape um so yeah unfortunately uh, you kind of you hit you hit on the point that we're that we're kind of making here which is that you got to do the mapping externally from shape to get uh, to rock how you want yeah but there definitely are some apps out there that let you um translate you know one midi note to another before it gets passed on the shape i'm not sure if it's on mac but like on windows there's one called uh, bohm's midi translator um, that doesn't add too much latency, but yeah, you need something like that, like a go-between piece of software that takes the incoming note off your brain, translates it to a different note, and then feeds it into shape via like a virtual MIDI driver. Nice. Um, da -da -da, people, yeah, <laughs> of course. Talk anytime we talk about drum sets, people we, the request for multi-output. Hit the feedback button. Let the team know how important multi-out drums are for you know. I know a bunch of you guys out there using like Superior Drummer and uh, some of those other drum uh, drum programs that support multi-outs. Uh, so let, let the Luna team know how important that is. Keep on hitting the feedback button. Even if you sent it in once before, send it in again. Let them know that it's still a big priority for what you're doing. Um, and nice. Uh, checking here through the chat. Uh, Matt, do you want to go ahead and switch your camera back? Oh, yeah. Star staring at your – I love looking at your dr at your drum brain, but I, kinda, I, like, I like seeing your face back. <laughs> See my face instead of my brain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nice. Well, uh, Matt, man, that's that's super cool. It's it's fairly easy, right? That we knew this would be kind of an easy process to be able to sh share with you guys. We wanted to make sure it was it was kind of laid out uh, as logically as possible. There. Uh, where is the feedback button? Brandon's asking. It's in the top right side of Luna. <laughs> it says feedback. I think it's I think it's in all caps. Um, yep. Uh, it is. Yep. A good question here from Rich. So auto apply is not input quantized. So how does it work? Uh, Matt, I know you're you're pretty familiar with the the MIDI editing quantize features. How, what's the difference between auto quantize and uh, something like input quantize? 
Yeah, so input quantize would actually, um, and it's that's not something Luna has right now, but that would actually take the incoming MIDI notes and quantize them in real time. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was playing out of time, it would basically uh, quantize the sounds that I'm hearing in real time. But um, what Luna does have is uh, like auto apply quantize. So once I record something in, um, if I have like a 16th note grid selected, um, I can basically just bring up the quantize menu in Luna, click the 16th note, and it'll automatically quantize it to that. Um, so yeah, if, if uh, input quantize is something that you would want, definitely hit the feedback button. Um, that's something that like Ableton Live um, and DAWs like that that are more meant for live performance uh, have. Mm -hmm. Luna being, you know, uh, has more of like the editing uh, quantize in the back end kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's so like does that mean with the yeah, I was gonna say with input with input quantize, does that mean you can never get back the original performance? Is that I'm not familiar with that. On some yes, some no, right? Like I've, okay. I've seen yeah, it both depends ways. on the implementation. Yeah, I got you, got you. I see, and Brandon, Brandon, who's asking where the feedback button is, uh, he's he's ha doesn't have Luna, but he's about to get his first Apollo this week. So, congratulations, nice. Brandon. Yeah, nice. Enjoy, enjoy. Yeah. And, and welcome and, to the family. And good on you for coming and checking out the office hours before you even have a UA uh, interface. Doing doing your homework. I like it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Smart. Nice. Um, all right. Let me scroll through. Any other questions around the drum kits? Uh, Terry's asking, will it be multi-tracking for the shape drum kits? Uh, nothing planned at this time, but again, if that's something you guys really want, uh, hit the feedback button. Uh, in the meantime, Terry, what I would recommend for that, and I think, Matt, we've demonstrated this before, right? Where you can kind of track things in on a single track, and then by duplicating the track, uh, that's a, a really easy way to you duplicate the MIDI and the sounds, and then you can go through and just quickly delete. Um, say you want to, you know, record in a whole drum set, and then you want to isolate your kicks, snare, hi-hats, et cetera, onto different tracks. A quick duplicate, 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 go through, just delete the unneeded notes for each one, and now you've got a multi-out. Um, you know, so it's a little bit of extra work on your part to, to separate out and, and, to, and to build it that way, but it's super helpful when you're in the moment of producing to just not think too hard about it, not try to like separate everything out, just capture what you want to capture, and then do that post-process of, of pulling them apart so that way you can treat each, uh, each sound a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what I do. I mean, just duplicate the track, and then for the first one, I'll basically just highlight every uh, note that isn't the kick. You can hit Command M; it'll automatically mute them. You don't have to delete them, um, and then you just have the kick on that one and repeat for all your other tracks as well. Mm -hmm. It's a little and takes a little bit more time. But it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, and you can select all of the notes for a given a given note for that the entire track by clicking on the piano roll, right? Yeah, and then you can just hold down the yeah. Shift key and click all the uh, the note lanes that you want to select, and you can just mute them that way as well. Yeah, right. Nice. Uh, see, Monty's with us today, but he's in the chat for it for with us today. Oh, it. hey, Monty. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, and John's also getting uh, getting his first Apollo. Like, it, guys, this is this is a great Monday so far. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Monty's right. busy working. Right, he's, he's working <laughs> know, on right? Luna, guys. <laughs> um, Awesome. Well, guys, so that's that's in general, that's a great great kind of setup uh, getting into MIDI drum kits. A lot of those lessons too would apply to if you're doing drum pat, you know, just like finger drumming. Uh, right. If you wanted to, you know, I've done this with, uh, with the Akai NPC, same sort of thing where you can go in and you can say, Hey, I want this pad to equal, you know, just do it by ear. Just like what Matt was showing you, just kind of scroll through the note numbers and, Oh, there's, there's the sound I want to be triggering. Um, so same, you know, whether you're using a MIDI drum kit, some pads, any sort of standalone controller, this is the way to, uh, to really get those going. Um, yeah. nice. Uh, Oh, no, no. Is that, how do you guys set up for MIDI when Apollo doesn't have dedicated MIDI ports? Um, so I guess, Matt, on this one, you're probably, are you using a USB interface or? Yeah. Yeah. My drum brain has um, just a USB out. So pretty much as simple as just installing the driver on my computer, connect it to USB, and then it shows up just like normal. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every, uh, I'd, I'd be very surprised if any modern drum brain doesn't have a USB out. That's a pretty standard feature nowadays. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For the most part, I think oh, almost every device that I have in the studio that's from like the 2000s on, they've got both MIDI ports and USB ports. Uh, but for the older stuff where it's just MIDI, uh, that's where, you know, getting like a standalone, you can go from very small and basic, like those MIDI Unos, they're just like one in, one out to a USB cable. And I've got a couple of those here. Uh, or there's you know, larger implementation. So if you do have a larger MIDI setup, uh, allows you to scale that up or down. Um, you know, I'm using in the studio, I've using the, uh, the I connectivity, the Mio XL and the Mio XM, uh, which are really powerful MIDI interfaces, uh, that I, I definitely would recommend to folks. 
Um, but yeah, there's, so there's a bunch of USB over MIDI. That seems to be everyone's number one way. Uh, and then a dedicated MIDI interface as you, as you grow, as your MIDI needs grow. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how I get the five pin stuff going in there. No, no. Uh, all right. Well, you guys are asking about a lot of, a lot of upcoming features and, and new stuff again, always, always be letting us know what you guys want to see, uh, here inside the app with the feedback button. Uh, but I feel like this would be a good, good chance to switch over to Drew screen. Uh, and let's talk, let's, let's geek out about the Fairchild, man. This is, this is one of those plugins that. It, it works in so many different contexts, so many different styles yeah. of music, like for mixing, for mastering. Uh, but it can also be a little bit, it can be a little bit intimidating because it's a, it's a, it's a monolith. It's a huge device. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's historic. It's, it's something that's just, uh, everyone kind of knows about it, but they're like, they also know that it costs a lot of money and they, you know, why does it command such a price? Why is it such a storied compressor? Why do people love it so much? Yeah, gosh, it's it's a tough question to really answer. I mean, first of all, I just want to say I think it's I'm really appreciative that everybody's digging these plug-in segments because I think we really like doing them, and it's it's one of my favorite things to do is to dig into these things and share with everybody these you know what it's good at and the little tidbits and going over it. So that's um, you know first and foremost. But yeah, this guy is it's really it really is like a storied thing. If you look at the history of it, it goes way back, and there's um, uh, you know to all sorts of weird you know the computer it has tie-ins to the computer business and aerial photography. I mean, it's like the people that developed this is if you mm -hmm. read some of their histories is, you know, and I'm kind of a history nerd myself and it's, it's super interesting um, how this came to be. And this thing, you know, the plugin belies how big it actually is. You know, I've actually had to set this thing up at NAM a couple of times, <laughs> yeah. take it out of its road case, right? <laughs> Matt's probably done it too, where it had, you know, it comes in, it comes into the convention center in a, uh -huh. in a padded, you know, shock mounted road case and you have to get it out of that and carefully put it onto the stage setup, which was just, yeah. I mean, talk about nerve wracking. Um, but yeah, anyway, every time yeah, we so bring it, it is... to NAM, I have to carry it down like three flights of stairs and, and like two or <laughs> yeah. three people to carry it. It's a beast. Yeah, <laughs> it's a behemoth. It's a behemoth. Um, and which is kind of interesting because people people may not know this, but like we do our, our best to get a hold of the units that we model. So like the one, we have the unit that we modeled. Um, it, you know, sometimes we borrow it and then, but, but whenever possible, we buy it. In the case of the Fairchild, I think we borrowed it for the modeling and then bought it later. So it's kind of a super interesting history there. But, um, and at HQ is all of these models that are in, you know, a wheel and flip studios. Um, but anyway, so the Fairchild, yeah, super, really interesting compressor. Lots of, uh, cool features that you, you know, some things that are not so obvious. Um, and, so I don't know where you want to start, Ben. You want to uh, you want me to start with examples? You want to walk through the GUI a little bit? What are you thinking? I, I, let's walk through the GUI real quick, just to ca catch okay. people up uh, on, on how all these different things work. Uh, because it, it it's not a ton of stuff to to really get, but getting the flow of how you adjust the Fairchild, I think, is really important for people to understand before we dive in. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's just we can just run through it kind of briefly. You know, we of course we have a power switch which you can access by uh, uh, hitting the either either the switch or the light will do it. So mm -hmm. this is a nice way of a being it with within the plugin. Those are the two best ways to do that. You kind of want to avoid the power switch. The power switch. Um, is will releases the DSP, but it also messes a little bit with Luna's delay compensation if this happens to be triggering any of that. So this is always the better way of bypassing a plugin uh, mm -hmm. inside the GUI, which so it doesn't mess with uh, any of the delay compensation. Um, and of course, here we have our our. Uh, well, let's you know we can start with the little guys. This this screw right here is a, is a very important screw for me. Um, the headroom screw, right? Which this is basically a, a reciprocal level that allows you to increase or decrease input while simultaneously increasing or de decreasing the output as needed. If you can think of it as kind of a trim inside of the model, right? So, mm -hmm. um, which allows you to, you know, if you want to clean it up, turn that headroom screw to the left. And what you'll do is reduce the input and reduce the output a corresponding amount. That's not what I want to do when I'm doing the Fairchild. In fact, the majority of the time, on this example, it's a mix where I don't have it done. But like when I use this, I use this a lot on vocals. And when I'm using it on vocals, I'm always cranking that headroom screw all the way to the right just to really push into the model. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> a lot. It, and you guys are good. You'll probably notice like that, that same headroom control. It's now, you know, the 1176 is the distressor. Uh, yeah. 33609. So a lot of you, it's the same sort of convention that you guys are going to find in lots of UAD plugins. So that's why it's such an important one to, to kind of, to understand its flexibility and how, it, how great of a, and useful of a knob that is. Because, uh, for me, it's one of those, like, 
oh crap, man, this sounds like too, it's, um, you know, especially if I get feedback from the clients, right? It feels too compressed or it feels like it, you know, it feels a little too kind of squished. If you want to unsquish something really fast, just come adjust that headroom control by one or two notches and you'll see your meter yeah. start reacting a little bit less. Everything cleans up a little bit. Uh, so you can really kind of, if you've painted yourself into a corner, that's a great knob to come grab to kind of paint yourself back out of that corner. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to frame it, Ben. It's it's right. Yeah, it's because what it's really doing is it's adjusting the input and output at the same time and simultaneously. So it's kind of, same with like the distressor. It's hard to kind of get that you know to do that simultaneously. So this headroom screw kind of does the does that for you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, so yeah, then we have some metering, which you know obvi some obvious stuff: input, output, and gain reduction. Mm -hmm. um, and to the right of that is is a balanced screw. This is a uh, this is the bias the the bias current inside the unit. Um, and I don't mess with that too much. I don't know if you guys have anything to say about it, but I don't mess with the balance too much. If you go too far one way or the other, you can start to create some pretty uh, pretty strange anomalies inside of it. So by all means, have fun with it and and uh, experiment with it. But I usually generally keep that at the default. Essentially, the default setting is like factory calibrated to the way the unit is supposed to operate, and then you can play around with it from there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys mess with that one much. I I personally don't. Nah, um, I leave that. I leave. I leave that. <laughs> I let one, that one lie. And, and yeah, because like yeah. the, the next couple of knobs, these are the ones that really influence the, the most. The most of your tone, right? Because yeah, this is for your sure. input, so, input gain. What, so essentially, this is how you turn up or turn down your way into the compressor. Correct. Yeah, for for real. So yeah, this guy. So you've got you've got, these two kind of work together. So you have input gain and threshold. And so what you, what you can do here is. Uh, input gain allows you to, uh, is in front of the tube stage in front of the, in front of any of the tubes. And so therefore, when you pull this back, you're cleaning up things, right? Um, and of, consequently, if you push it, you're going to be pushing into the compressor and you'll dirty it up. So, so the amount of compression is really de dependent upon the position of these two knobs. So for example, if I push this, I'm increasing the input to the compressor and it will simultaneously trigger more gain reduction. Um, if I want it to be really clean, and this is something, I don't do this a lot because I like the color of the Fairchild, but mm -hmm. in addition to what we spoke about with the headroom screw, you could pull down the input gain to clean it up and then crank that threshold. Um, and that will get allow you to get the compression that you want, but but not push it so hard into the unit. And then, of course, you'll have to make up for it with the output gain as well. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so those are super important for figuring out what you're doing as far as how getting how you want this this guy to behave. Well, um, and the, the threshold knobs it throws out to people who aren't familiar with you, know, you haven't been messing with the Fairchild uh, for or Fairchild emulations for many years. It's a little counterintuitive. Zero, going all the way to the left, is not actually. That's when the threshold is the highest. So if right, you, so right. as Drew mentioned, like if you if you leave the threshold at zero, you can you can turn the you can actually do. I've seen this as a trick that some people do. They'll go threshold at zero, and then they just use the Fairchild as a tone box. So they're basically using the input gain to drive into it and, and saturate the tubes and transformers that are inside of it, but without adding any compression whatsoever. Um, and then of course, you know, just kind of moving up a little bit off of zero, then you start getting a little bit of compression as you start cranking, you'll start seeing the compression acting more and more. So it goes from yeah. no compression to lots of compression is, is how that threshold's really kind of acting. Yeah. And you'll hear that what Ben's talking about when I, when I eventually play this song, because th this, like, this is what the Fairchild's really good at. I kind of, I like to think of the Fairchild as like a compressor with with a mini like a partial pull tech mixed in because it really has this like sort of warmth that it does to the bottom end and it really ties the bottom end together uh really really well so totally. definitely play around with those you know the hardware the hard the hard the headroom screw rather and then input and threshold these are all very interactive uh you know controls for each other mm -hmm. and that's um, what brandon brandon was asking just now like what you know it, the difference between why would you use the input gain versus the headroom knob or vice versa yeah, I would say I would think think of the headroom screw just as you described it, Ben. The ability to globally sort of drive into or drive out of the model, so it's a big, broad stroke kind of thing. Whereas the input gain and the threshold are individual parameters within the settings of the actual compressor. So I would think of think of headroom as big, broad strokes, either less or more, and then because it's impacting it's impacting everything throughout the entire model. Whereas uh, these thresholds and inputs are are more zoomed in. And they're more detailed parameters within the actual compressor itself, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, totally. And that's uh, you know the headroom when it's at midnight like it is here. Uh, that's and same with the balance. Like those two controls, the reason why they're set where they're set, it's like that's kind of factory default calibration. So yeah. uh, you know, it's 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 the ideal place to start. And that's that's why my recommendation is always leave those leave those be as long as you as you can until you know that you want to adjust them because you can get m so much of the tone of the Fairchild and again it's 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 emulating a, a real piece of hardware if you want it to be acting like that real piece of hardware did leave those where they're at and then get your sound by adjusting the input uh, gain and threshold um, and then that kind of brings us to yes you know, so we got input gain we got threshold that brings us to <laughs> the number one knob to have to that you're going to deal with here which is the time constants uh one yeah. labeled arbitrarily labeled one through six <laughs> yeah, literally right. the, the the numbers actually have actually nothing to do with real real it's just six different not at all quote unquote yep. presets of time essentially right yeah so essentially yeah the fairchild ties the the attack and the release together right and so so the ones you'll notice I have it set to one. One is my favorite. It's the, you know, it's, it's the fat, this, this guy is a fast attack all the way around. So even, <laughs> even, yep. even when it's at fastest is 200 microseconds. So we're talking 0.2 milliseconds and at its slowest, it's uh, 800 microseconds or 0.8 milliseconds. Uh, so no matter what you do, it's going to be fast acting, but it's, 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 it's a nice saturated sort of tube vibe so even when it even though it's fast and sometimes that can be associated with robbing transients it doesn't happen here because it's just it's just really good at absorbing them and preserving them and making that part of its of its mojo mm -hmm. um i personally do do one uh because it's the it's the 200 milliseconds attack and then the 300 milliseconds of release which is not super fast by modern standards but it was but by then by those standards it was back in the day yeah. uh five and six i generally try and avoid these are these are the auto or what's called program dependent and these are multi-staged uh releases these have multi-stage releases you can look in the manual for all the details but basically these five, five and six are um really sort of uh uh monitoring the the gain structure of the material it's it's that that you're running through it hence the term program dependent um and i don't know about you ben but like me i'm I'm pretty much just like almost every instantiation it's just one i mean it's just one for me it's always one always one i, would, I don't know i would you, love but. i'd love to i'd love to pull pull the audience here uh everyone in the chat if you guys are if you're already using the fairchild uh, let's drop it in the chat what your favorite time constant to use is uh and i'm drew i'm i'm with you personally i'm a yeah i don't but that I, might I've, just be habit it might just I, I, habit, I can't tell you know? exactly. I can't tell if it's a habit thing, but for me, it, it's always parked on one. Uh, I, yeah. I think I've maybe once or twice used the two. If I and the big thing to know here is that the attack time between one and two stays the same. It's the release time. So mm -hmm. when you're going with a longer release, typically what I associate a longer release, it almost sounds more compressed, right? Because it's reacting and then it's holding that compression in place for a longer period of time so it can be smoother in some ways but it can also sound just it gives a more obvious compressed tone to it to my ear mm -hmm. um, well yeah. and yeah when that and the slower one i generally like i like i don't you know most times i like coloration and audibility like that's my thing that's what i that's mm -hmm. what drew me to ua that's what drew me to the uad plugins was like you know i come from the gear itself and i'm used to the gear helping me so when you run something through the gear i want it to color i want coloration i want functionality i want it to be doing stuff and so for me um you know one and one and maybe two occasionally but mostly one just kind of gives me that that even at 200 milliseconds which like i said by modern standards is kind of is on the slower side compared to what we might be used to with uh you know, pure so digital for, stuff. Certainly. So good for drums, yeah. right? Like, cause yeah, it lets, yeah. it lets through like the transient and the, the attack of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's why you guys are going to find Fairchilds are a great compressor. Uh, you know, a lot of people use these for mix, for mix bus duties, for mastering, for drum groups, um, uh, for things that, you know, need to get held together and need to kind of react, uh, in a good way. And, and of course, as we've mentioned multiple times, it's a lot of tubes and a lot of transformers that go into this, um, yeah, I gotta say in the in the UAD manual, this is one of my favorite ones to read. There's so if you guys haven't checked it out already, this is actually like reading the manual for the Fairchild is is you, I learned so much the first time I dove in there and actually read it. Like beyond learning what the actual time constants meant, um, it was you know you learn a little bit more about the history, about the tubes, the transformers, the topology of this compressor because it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, it really is. Uh, so Matt, uh, don't want to. Do you have a favorite time constant before I uh, shout out all the chat ones? I usually leave it on one unless uh, something sounds funky. Then I just kind of audition the others and see what I like. But most <laughs> mm -hmm. often it's one. 
All right, we got uh, we got a two or three for base, one or two at the most. Uh, faves are two and four. That, that's a vote for four. Keep keep that in mind. I'm not sure we're gonna see many more of those. Uh, <laughs> use two at times, but eighty percent one, one, two, three on mix bus. Nice. One and six always. Two, one or four. I think I leave it at four. Victor Victor's unsure what he leaves it at. Uh, can one or two, one, six. Uh, to level an entire song, yep. That five and six, that, that's they, those were they, they were made for a reason. Like they're very complex uh, circuits for, to to create that program dependent. Uh, but it is for a reason because it hold it can do a great job of holding a track in a spot. Um, mm-hmm. One, one, da, 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 drums and bass. Eleven, no wait, one, uh, <laughs> two, like one, one on vocals, four, one, one. Yeah, we got a lot of one fan. It's, it's pretty universal. Like every, one, one is kind of one of the. It's kind of the go-to for a lot of folks. Um, but the cool thing is that you do have these other options. And Matt, I love your approach to it. Of like, yeah, I start at one, but if it's not working, it's a really easy one to kind of explore some of the other options. Uh, to, you know, with the time constant because it does changing that attack and release changes the character of what you get back out of the box so much. Um, yeah, and that's a good it's a good thing to talk about in general, just the idea of like falling into ruts. Like it's so easy as an engineer, as a mixer, you you know, you a producer, you 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 find something that works once and you think I'm just gonna do that every time, but it's super important to like don't is to get outside of that box and try new things. You'll explore you'll mm-hmm. find new things, you know, you'll find new ways of using stuff for sure. Yeah. The, uh, I almost like that it's not labeled uh with specific times because a lot of times you get caught in that thinking of I need this particular time for this particular yep. application, but where yeah. it just has numbers, you don't really know what they're associated with. You just really use your ears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and Arthur in the chat's asking, "What's the slow attack, slow release time constant?" So, uh, I'm, I've actually I've got the manual up, so I get this all right today. Uh, position four <laughs> is is the slowest overall. So it's eight hundred microseconds attack, and then five seconds release. So it's going to be slow, slow on the take, but then super slow on the release. Um, and of course position six, you could argue is even slower of a release because it's, <laughs> it's program dependent. So it'll do 300 milliseconds for the transient 10 seconds for the multiple peaks. So general it's around that 10 second mark. But then if you've, if you've been hammering it, it'll, it'll take up to 25 seconds for it to fully recover, <laughs> which is wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's super, super, super long. Um, multi-stage release there. Yeah, and it's it is it's a fascinating sound, guys. And you know, with any compressor, this is this should just be like kind of a broad how to treat compressors in general. There's a couple of ways to do it. Treat them like they're tone boxes. Like we talked about this with Fab last week. Think of compressors as EQs because they are doing so much tone work for you. Uh, but then also, you know, in terms of how they control the levels, like you can punish them, you can be nice to them. You have you have a lot of options available to you and how you think and how you treat your compressors. Uh, and Fairchild is one of those ones that reacts at all stages. So it can be clean and nice and just give you a, a gentle touch on your mix bus every once in a while. You can slam drums through it and really crank the saturation, crank the transients, just suck all the... Uh, it's You can get this really punchy, amazing tone out of it. Uh, so there's you, you're going to find uses for the Fairchild kind of all over your mixes. And, and we'll dive into a few other features here, uh, as well as there's a 660 that we're, we got to we touch on briefly as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So Drew, what what's the what's the control between the two time constants? What's that? Yeah, so this for? one, yeah, this one is interesting. If if uh, this one is, it's labeled uh, AGC and it's it's left and right or lat and vert. And so if you know anything about uh, the way vinyl works and the way uh, it's an alternative way of thinking of stereo as as opposed to left and right, you can think of stereo as. Uh, what's common to this to the uh, between the left and the right side or the mono signal and then what's different between the left and the right which would be the sides and and in, in you know in the old days what, on a cutting lathe that's referred to as lateral movement and vertical movement and so it's literally this the cutting the cutting head where think about a you know we've all worked with record players and think about putting that stylus down into the groove and that stylus is actually moving both laterally and vertically at the same time so uh Typically, stereo is left and right, and so a two-channel unit like this would control the left side and the right side. But by putting it in lat vert, um, it's essentially mid-side mode, um, and therefore one of the channels of the compressor will will focus on the mono information, and the other channel is focusing on the difference or the or the side information. Um, my demo is not set up for it. I think maybe you have one, Ben, maybe where you could, if you're going to do a little demo. Um, but essentially what th- this is really important when combined with these two link controls. 
because this mm -hmm. and this radically uh, impact how this compressor is going to behave. Um, so you'll notice down here, the link button, we have two different toggles. One is side chain and one is the controls. So, and you can, you can adjust them separately from each other. And so combined with this, uh, will determine whether or not. So let me just put it in lat vert mode. And if with both things linked, then when I move one, I'll move the other. That's the controls part. But then also when, when they're linked, the side chain will also be linked. And what this means is that the mid and the side will be, will achieve will be given the same amount of gain reduction. Um, you know, the detection circuit would be summed and, and it'll give an amount there so as to not shift the image if that would be your desire. Mm -hmm. um, however, I can I can link unlink just the side chain, at which point I'm telling the compressor, feel free to compress the mids different from the sides. Now, if they're radically different, you might have image shift, but very often that's what you want to do, right? Sometimes yeah. you'll choose mid side, you know, and unlink them for creative purposes or to dig in. I remember that one, Example you did Ben last year with this the 1176 and its thrust surf circuit like radically changed the way that loop sounded. So this could be similar to that. If you have a really dense loop that has a lot some mono information, maybe some kick and snare in the mono, and then maybe some percussion that's that's um, on the sides, you could literally you know control make this compressor you know, slam the kick and snare while being gentle on the percussion that's left and right, or vice versa, be gentle on the kick and snare because they're already hyped up enough and allow you to like really add some some movement and energy to percussion that's on the side. So it, this is, lots that's of power one, there. It, this is one of my favorite things to do with the Fairchild is, yeah, switching to lat vert mode, which, yeah, <clears throat> as Drew called out and uh, Daniel was getting your happy face on here in the, uh, in the chat as well. It's a mid side mode, so it makes that yeah. top row of knobs those are all not controlling the mid so like your kick your snare your bass the meat of your mix is now you have an input gain and a threshold dedicated to those and then <clears throat> the side channel which is you know everything else all of your <clears throat> sorry all of your reverbs your uh, strings guitars everything that's happening not basically anything that's not perfectly down the middle is now being affected by that side channel um, and what the first thing you're going to know is, is, is when you go to lat vert mode, you'll see if you have the side chain and the controls linked, you'll see they're, they're both kind of working really hard and it, it kind of loses a little bit of power. The minute you unlink the side chain, you'll notice the middle channel will continue to react to all the heavy stuff in the middle, the kicks and the snares. But now the side channel is getting way less compression. So this can give you a great, and you gotta, you gotta, you know, use your taste and use your judgment when you're doing this. But it can essentially take your control, your kick, snare, vocal, bass, all that stuff that's happening perfectly down the middle of your mix. You can compress that and have those kind of respond to each other while leaving the sides of your mix able to breathe a little bit. And or you can, you know, adjust the threshold independently until you just get a little bit of squeeze, a little bit of push happening on your side information while your middle mm -hmm. information is getting compressed. It's once once you guys play around with this on a mix, it's it's really hard to go back because it gives you so much cool balance control, and then you're not worried about your stereo image shifting from left to right. It's now shifting middle to side energy wise, um, and it, it for mastering for mix bus duties like all that sort of stuff. Highly highly recommend you guys checking checking out the Latvert mode. But then as Drew pointed out. Go down there that to, li to the link section and, and make sure you disable those two links because that that allows them to really work independently, which you want you're gonna want to do when you're in lat vert mode. Yeah, and it's great on buses too, like on groups. Like if you're if you use a multi bus approach, that having these on your on like the multi buses, you know, any of your subgroups that feed into the main out. It's think of this as being able to like literally depending on how you set this, like take your guitars or take your keyboards and literally kind of like send them out. And or bring them back in a little bit. It's almost like by favoring mm -hmm. the side, you can pull them out, push them out, and pull down the center. It's almost like a sort of a quasi imaging and shaping of, of your of your groups. It's well, definitely fun to play with, dude. And, and right to that same point, Drew. Like now with the input gain control, when you change the input gain on your vertical channel, uh, as I remember, right, the, the the they transform from left right inputs to now being mid side inputs. Correct. Yeah, yeah. When you unlink it, when when these are unlinked, you have you know have full on you know full on independent control of the input and the output and everything. So they become mm -hmm. fully you know fully separate things. Nice. Well, and so then at the bottom of there, there's you know so we talked about the two link controls. Important to know, but there's yeah three more kind of parameters down here. You got a sidechain filter, an output knob, and then most importantly the the mix that mix knob. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Available. People love their mix knobs, don't they? Um, so yeah, of course, the original hardware didn't have didn't have a mix knob, but yeah. So <laughs> you know, as Ben was talking about earlier, you know, you could really get a lot. Really, you can put this to one hundred percent and and dial up the most amazing or the most uh, colorful and rich thing. Especially when you're talking about some of those program dependent ones, like if you want to, you know any of these really, but, but then if it, if it all just feels a little bit too much, you know, then of course you've got your mic, internal mix knob to be able to dial that back a little bit, which is super, super handy and helpful there. And then the side chain filter is really important in, in my, in my mix, you'll notice I have it set up quite high. Um, so this is something that, you know, the side chain filter is, you know, telling it's removing low end from the detection circuit. So it doesn't have anything to do with what you hear sonically it's not removing bottom end um but instead what it's doing is removing bottom end from the detection circuit which in the case of a full mix like i have here um it'll keep that from you know pump making the compressor pump or work too hard um i find that i almost always have this in up in some manner shape or form i can't even imagine not using it in some case sometimes quite high um and uh sometimes not so much but you know it's it's so that's really important that that keeps it if you're mixing a lot of low end information and it and you feel like the the low end or the kick is making the compressor pump then sidechain filters definitely what you want to adjust there it, it can say it can say it's saved lives before and will save lives again uh <laughs> yes, mixes, it has. That is. It has. uh yeah. because yeah you can just you, just you can just get in there and yeah if you're kicking your bass or you know if you feel, it's this is a this is all a feel thing guys so like if you're listening to it and you're like it feels like it's kind of overreacting to it, but you're enjoying the color when it is doing it. Uh, you know, cause there's like any compressor, there's like three or four different ways to achieve a result uh, out of it. So if you're like, man, this feels a little too compressed, you listen to it and you're like, what do I do? Do I go to the headroom control? Do I lessen my input gain? Do I change my threshold? Do I do a side chain? Do I go to the mix knob? You literally, there's like five different things can, that can affect the amount of compression that you get. So yep. what you start to learn, what you kind of get in the habit of over time is is kind of identifying to yourself what thing needs to be tweaked to get me the result that I want to be hearing from this box. Because sometimes it's like, man, I love I love everything about this, but I just want a little bit less. Go to the mix knob, yep. pull that back yep. a little bit until until you're getting, or you know, go all the way off and then start bringing it back in until you have enough that you want. Uh, that's one way to do it. You, if you're like, man, it's if when you're listening to it, like it's just it's it feels like it's pumping too much. It feels like my kick and my bass are pushing it too hard. Side chain filter, come in, just make it so it's listening to less of those low frequencies and reacting less to those. Uh, yeah. If overall you're like, man, it's just it feels like too much. Maybe the headroom control is. There's uh, the the cool thing is there's no one right way to to deal with that with feeling it like it's a little too compressed <laughs> or that it's it's a little too much. Uh, you know, but it's good to, this is the hardest thing as a mixing engineer, right? Is to be honest with yourself and be like, am I compressing it too much? If so, what should I change? Uh, and that's where the on, the quick on off and making sure you have your stuff gain staged well, uh, on off, like, you know, Fab talked about this last week as well. Like sometimes it sounds better with no compression and just because mm -hmm. you think you need a compressor on a thing doesn't mean you actually do need a compressor on a thing. Um, yeah. so it, it's, it's really important to be auditioning this stuff and then know that you have so many different opportunities to change or slightly tweak the sound, change how the compressor is reacting. Uh, and then this is all made so much more important because the Fairchild adds so much tone, the more input gain you give it, the less, you know, more input gain, less headroom, more of the mix knob, like all these settings really change the color and how hard it's hitting tubes and transformers and giving you not just compression, but also giving you saturation and harmonics to the sound as well. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, let's, let's just finish it out with the, the last little segment here, this last uh, down here in the corner, um, which is, you know, you might've, if you're familiar with compressors, then you might be asking, where's the ratio knob? Where's the ratio knob? Um, mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is operates in a slightly different way. And down here in the bottom right hand corner, is uh, this what they call the DC threshold. And it, it determines the ratio as well as the knee, as you can see from the little graphics here. And so this is a, these are, of course, these are adjustable, or you can click right on the uh, on these two different tags, right? This, this sort of is uh, emulating maybe some somebody putting some grease pencil marks on the actual unit itself. And the OWR is Ocean Way Recording, because this was the unit that we got, came out of Ocean Way, and this is what it was set up for that. But we also... Uh, we also modeled a calibrated mode. Um, and I actually, I prefer the ocean way myself. It's, as you can see it, as you go to the clockwise, it's going to soften the knee, right? Mm -hmm. So a harder knee to the left, softer knee to the right. And I prefer that just be uh, for, especially for mix bus duties, but, but, but don't be afraid to yank that 
you know, to the left, if you want to, if you want this guy to be really like, uh, clamping on a vocal, you know, doing something super duper aggressive and then pulling back the mix knob. Right. So don't be afraid to go hard knee, um, and, and a uh, higher ratio at, versus the softer knee sections. So, um, yes. that, that's a, that's an area that if some people, you know, you, maybe you, maybe you've never actually moused around down there and understood that you could change that. You know what I mean? It's, it's that's a, entirely possible. <laughs> it's an easy, it's an easy one when there's such big knobs up top that do yeah. so much, it can be easy to forget that there's two little knobs down there. Um, yeah. It was a good good question a little bit ago here from uh, from Basic. It was asking, you know, so the left right output knobs are still left right even in lat mode? Question mark. Yes, correct. So th this is the one the one thing I find myself doing all the time when I go to lat vert mode is uh, unlinking those controls as we showed you. But then when I go to adjust my output quickly, you can you can put it back into link just on the controls, move those two to, around if I need to gain stage rate, and then de-link the controls again so that way I can continue adjusting uh, the rest of the parameters. Um, and it, we get do so many people in the chat are like, as soon as I'm back in my studio or in, in, the, in the seat, I'm gonna be, they're going to be checking out the Fairchild. And this is, more than anything, guys, uh, that's the best way to, to audition UA plugin. As much as uh, you know, it would be fun for us to just th throw you guys like a thousand different examples here in the moment, uh, the, our real goal is to get you guys inspired to go try these out for yourself because nothing beats mm -hmm. hearing it on your own speakers with your own music and stuff that you're familiar with. So you can really start to get used to, to what these controls can do and what these plugins can offer sonically. Um, there, this is something anytime that, uh, whenever we're testing or getting ready to release a plugin, this is all I'm doing for, for the weeks leading up to the launch is like putting on every single mix I'm doing, like pulling up old mixes and trying it out and stuff and really trying to, cause for, you know, our goal is like a, as engineers is to like learn these things and really just kind of know when should I pull out the 670 versus say like a 33609, you know, you, you yeah. start learning the nuances which are not just sonic nuances, but it's also practical nuances, right? Like this, you know, some yeah. of you may not have known this Fairchild 670 is a mid-side compressor limiter built into it. Okay, now that instantly kind of puts it ahead of some other, uh, some of the other bus compressors that don't offer a mid-side mode. So if I'm approaching a mix or a master that I know I need to treat my mid and side information differently, I'm going to maybe, you know, default to open up the Fairchild to try it on first as opposed to, uh, say, like a 33609 or something like that. Yeah, and it's all these subtleties that people, I see people all the time, you know, we do it, other companies do it, they release a plugin and there's, you know, some naysayers are like, well, gosh, do we really need another compressor? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, we do, right? It's right. like if that that attitude, if you'd have had that attitude 50 years ago, we'd have none of this cool stuff, right? So anyway, that's just one of my little pet peeves. But yeah, it's like, the, it's all of these little intricacies that make, and, and it goes back to what Matt said earlier. Don't be afraid. Don't, you know, a lot of people are going to go home and use the Fairchild and they're going to love it and they're going to think it's cool, but then don't make it the only thing you use for the next three weeks. Like put it into your rotation and, mm -hmm. and don't lose that sense of experimentation because yeah, we, we fall into, we're creatures of habit, you know? Yeah. But if you're doing a two week demo, use it as much yeah. as you can for those first two weeks. Yeah, right. That's true. For sure. <laughs> Nice. And I guess right. somebody, do we want to, do we want to play this? Uh, yeah, we do. We do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. We're, we're, we're sitting here talking about how good it sounds the whole time without hearing how good it sounds. Let's hear yeah, right. how good it sounds, Drew. Walk, walk us through some stuff. Yeah. So let me just, let me just preface this by saying that, you know, I prepped this example on my barefoot speakers, which are, you know, super full range speakers and, 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 you know, studio monitors. So, uh, this is, this might not seem as obvious, certainly if you're on earbuds or even if you're on any sort of headphones, but I, I can assure you rewatch this on really good full range monitors and you'll see, you'll see what this guy is doing to this mix. Um, is this I guess the, I'll start with it on. Only th is this the only thing in your chain or are there other plugins also changing the, the sound? Uh, no, this is it. Yeah. This is, this is like, uh, this is a, a printed mix. Um, yeah. Of a client of mine. Her name's Ryan Wright. She's a great, fantastic singer. She's like 19 years old. She's super, super talented. But, um, anyway, yeah. So this is the only thing going, this is a, a printed mix. So I just kept it simple. Mm -hmm. Um, so this would be, this would be an example in a, in a mixing scenario. So imagine this is on your master fader, even though you're seeing it here on a printed mix. Um, nice. So yeah, let, I'll start with it on and I'll just, this is the chorus of the song right here and I'll just toggle it on and off every couple measures and notice what happens to the bottom end and the cohesion of the bottom end and how it, and, and, and the mix in general just sort of is pulled together. It's a, uh, it's subtle, but it's in my opinion, uh, pretty transformative. So let's give it a listen.
So Dude. subtle, but man, like it, and, and notice that's a legit game. That's a legit level matched AB. A lot of people try and do ABs and the bot that, but the width compression is, is a DB and a half louder and they're tricking you with volume. That's a legit <laughs> level matched a b and it's like the bottom end is just transformed in my opinion i don't know what are you guys hearing what do you think ben uh so i mean immediately for me i hear the saturation but i also more importantly hear the how the connectedness now because you know the what, what the kick in the bass that 808 right that's pushing it's now kind of pushing with the vocal uh and just it man it made that whole thing go together and uh just to, i gotta echo a bunch of these uh comments here just the glue daniel's like the glue uh, hell of a difference subtle loving the smoothness uh it's Good. like the I'm life comes that. into it massive a uh, huge difference love that saturation it's money in the bank right there from paul <laughs> love it super massive <laughs> uh but like you i'm liking the sound of this fair child and the ideas we're talking about nice so you guys, you guys are picking up what we're putting down here right like this is man it, it's not just a compressor it's not just sitting there it's not just changing the level like it is adding so much more to the tone and to the bounce and to the life of the track um so yeah dude I, I, i'm i'm hearing it and so and right now the mode you have it in lat vert mode so it's in the mid side mode but you guys noticed uh he has the controls and the side chain linked together in that example yeah um so this way the whole the the image doesn't you're not gonna get like a kind of wider narrower you're not going to get this like pumping of the image they're going to move together um so it's a that's a that's one of those controls that sometimes it sounds good unlinked sometimes it sounds better linked and honestly that was just an a, a, that was just an accident i meant i you know i meant it to be on regular stereo i just forgot to put it back before we did it but yeah with the link to, with the controls linked it's not radically different because it's a relatively symmetrical mix and so forth but yeah so. Mm -hmm. yeah adds so much move brandon's saying adds so much movement it sounds about thirty thousand dollars to the mix <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> guys the cool thing about this plugin is it allows you to charge more for your mixes and masters <laughs> <laughs> if only that were true i know right uh <laughs> so yeah so Drew, I mean, man that's such a good example. and again the saturation part of it this is the th this is going to be the thing that i i personally feel like i'm i'm tweaking the most inside the fairchild is like because uh, it's very easy to get there and like you know anywhere as you start cranking that input gain you guys will start hearing the harmonics of stuff The you'll hear it especially in the 808 and the bass like those are the, that's always the most obvious area to hear saturation being added uh do you mind just kind of playing around especially with like the headroom control and the mix knob kind of showing yeah, people sure. what, what uh what the options are there yeah, I'll just do some random stuff as we're going here. I'll, so maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll mess with the headroom, as Ben mentioned. But we'll, we'll see how we can drive it up and make it more aggressive and pull it down. That does impact some, your gain staging because it does impact. Uh, so sometimes that's a little bit, uh, it does impact the output. But let's just do it. And yeah, we'll mess around with the mix knob and stuff. If I can clean it up, make it cleaner. So you can see now driving that headroom, I could clean it up. At first I went cleaner and a lot mm -hmm. of that saturation that Ben was noticing kind of went away, but, but some of it, you, so you could tailor that. And then when I went more leaned into it, of course, now I, then, then I might need to back off some mix. Like. So there's another way to clean it up there by pulling down the input and up in the output. You know, mm -hmm. that's another way of cleaning it up. So, well, man, the, the mix knob for me, that's it's uh, that thing is so huge because it allows you, and I do this on especially on like drum parallel buses or just anytime I'm, I really want some smash happening inside of my mix, <laughs> I'll yeah. send it, send it into the Fairchild, just dime the comp dime the gain as much a bunch of threshold par park it on one because that's gonna be the, the most obvious compression effect and then mm -hmm. tweak that mix knob you know till, till it feels right because you're able to get the like attitude and the aggression happening from the plugin but then you can bring back you know the natural sound the the, the less compressed thing so you kind of end up getting the best of both worlds happening where you're getting mm -hmm. tone and character and punch and push and squeeze all happening but at a reasonable amount and that you're still able to like hear the air and the life and the the transients coming through much more cleanly uh as you as you back that mix knob off yeah yeah it's uh, good stuff 
That's awesome. Well, uh, Drew, uh, people are wondering about your vocal vocal chain specifically on this mix. Uh, any uh, uh, any cool stuff that that you? It's, I mean, it sounds it sounds badass. There's like what a, a center channel and like some. It sounds like distorted kind of side processing or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this song was mixed by a guy named Ethan, uh, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, so I don't have the access to the exact thing. This was a, a mastering project, um, uh, one of my clients that I did the mastering for. So this nice. is that raw mix that I began with. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Paul's Paul's remembering Jazzy uh, when we had Jazzy Jeff on. He was raving about the Fairchild as well. This is this is truly one of those tools that like. Uh, every, almost every engineer I know knows and loves and finds uses for the Fairchild on stuff. Um, and yeah, whether it's as a tone box, as a compressor, as a mix bus, as a parallel thing, uh, there's so much cool stuff in there. Uh, great question here, though, from Rick Whitfield. He's asking, what's the difference between the version that we're showing now, the 670, and the Fairchild Legacy? Yeah, uh, quite a lot actually um you know not only is it is it is the is this an end-to-end -end model you know it, which is kind of like where all of the 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 circuitry in it is modeled both the input and the output and all the tubes and transformers so the legacy is going to just capture sort of the compression behavior without all of the extra sort of non-linearities um and honestly i don't i haven't opened it in a while but i'm i'm a, it, i don't does it have a mix control ben i can't remember i don't think it does i mean I'm yeah uh, yeah maybe maybe uh maybe you're in a better position to answer that one yeah, so it's no, it's uh, I can share my screen for you guys here, so you can see the two side by side. Um, so yeah, so you'll notice a lot of the similarities, very similar controls. But you notice headroom control was not in, not uh, present in the legacy version, and then the mix, the mix output, um, and the sidechain filter are both oh, okay. not have that. Okay. not in there. Yeah, so this is a. Uh, this is the original model. So, you know, there, there some of the advantages for using this, the uh, legacy, uh, it uses less DSP. It, it's, a, you know, it's a little, it doesn't have, as Drew mentioned, doesn't have all the tubes and transformers uh, inside of it as well. Uh, so it's a little bit less colorful. It still, it still models the, the response and the characteristics of it, but it's not an end to end, every single component being modeled like the, the updated 670. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the 660, um, which is the mono version of the 670. Um, and, the, you know, so if you're, you know, say on like a bass or a guitar or a lead vocal, uh, if it's not a stereo track, you can pull up the mono version of it. Uh, and between the 660 and the 670, all the controls uh, are similar, except obviously you don't need a lat vert mode to it. Um, but Drew, one of the other cool things, right? That these are, it's not like they just chopped a 670 in half and called it a 660. These are actually, they modeled a different unit for it, correct? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're definitely, they are different. They are different animals um, and they do sound different, you know, and, and just to give you an idea what that uh, sound difference is, if you want to share my screen real quick, Ben, I can mm -hmm. just give you an idea. Yeah. Um, I can just give you an idea about, uh, I, ha I have this uh, little, analyzer plugin doctor loaded up and you can see that the, you know the 670 is is this top line and then the 660 is this bottom line now of course we're way down low you know we're way down here you know this is 50 hertz and this is 20 hertz but still you can kind of get a feel for uh you know the 670 in the way it's reach the way it handles and reshapes the bottom end and then the 660 rolls it off a little bit more gently um so keep that and you know keep that in mind um when you're choosing between those two um so they, they're definitely different animals, different colorations. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's not just the six. It, they were, they were different. They were different golden units and so forth. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, well, yeah, guys, man, we, uh, we powered great show. The, uh, got to talk about two very different things, MIDI drum kits inside of shape. And then, uh, <laughs> and then going fully classic with, with the Fairchild 670, <laughs> yeah, um, super I uh, saw a suggestion here. Arthur is asking us to uh, to cover the 175, 176. Uh, we will. I'll make a note of that, Arthur, and it will. It yeah. shall be so. Uh, next week we've got a special show, so we, it won't be next week because we got something. Uh, we got something special for you guys coming next week. Uh, but check out. You know, continue. Make sure you guys are subscribed to our channel and hitting the notification bell, so that way your phone buzzes every time that we go live, and you'll never miss a single plugin tip or a Luna preview or you know plugin launches. Uh, we're we're doing lots of cool stuff with these shows, especially this year. 
Uh, we're trying to do more and more of these, you know, kind of planned segments. Uh, so I hope you guys are enjoying kind of the deeper dives from a week to week uh, point of view, as well as ans- hopefully answering to all the questions uh, that you guys are uh, are coming with here in the show. It's so cool to see hang out with you guys here in real time. Um, and I'm just checking through the comments, to make sure we don't miss anything important. Uh, people are wondering what's next. Just got to tune in next week to, to see what's happening next week. <laughs> It's called a tease. That's how it works. <laughs> That's how it works, guys. Um, and plugin scaling for future. Yep. So yeah, be world the plugin scaling thing. The they're adding Retina graphics uh, to more and more of the UAD plugins. Um, so you know they're constantly constantly updating those those GUIs. Um, yeah, Tricky is saying he loves the deeper dives. So, awesome. I'm so glad you guys are liking this. Uh, the format for this stuff. Control surface finally? Question mark. Yeah. Uh, Max, you never know. You get you got to tune in to find out. Um, and so, guys, I think, unless I'm forgetting anything else, everybody, thank you so much for hanging out with us. To, uh, again, we'd love to hear some live music from you guys. Hit us up live at uaudio.com. Hashtag Universal Audio for all your pictures. Get into those opening countdowns. Uh, don't. Uh, I believe there's a there's a pretty killer sale still going on over on the UAD store. Uh, so if you do like the Fairchild, if you like what we're showing you guys here, I'm pretty sure that one's in the deals right now for uh, it was like 50 percent off. Um, it's it's a hot 50 sale uh, going on right now. So be sure to check that out. Download the Everyman Luna session inside of Luna over on the Discover tab. Uh, man, there's like a thousand different things I could be mentioning, but I'm just going to forget them all and I'll talk to you guys about them again next Monday. (laughs) Everybody have a great week. Go out there, make some music, have some fun, stay safe. Catch y'all later. Bye everybody.